Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedecase. I have a couple degrees in theology, and I'm working on another in philosophy of religion. And throughout my time in my studies, I've had some really awesome conversations with just amazingly brilliant people. But unfortunately, I've not recorded those uh, conversations. So the goal of this podcast, then, is to record the same type of conversations where we go deep on philosophy, theology, nature, and life with experts in those fields to record those, and then to share them with you so that you get to learn as I learn. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about creation ex nihilo, and I have with me Dr. Brian Orr, and we're going to be covering some of his work on uh, Thomas Ord's work. Um, it's, It's going to be really fascinating. I'm super excited to talk about creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, and some alternatives to that uh, view. Before we jump in, though, I want to thank everyone over... uh, on Patreon, all my patrons. You guys are awesome. I seriously, seriously appreciate what you guys do in supporting the podcast. If this is your favorite podcast, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, you can find the link in the description and any kind of support would go a long way. If I got like 300 of you guys, even for $3 a month, that would be huge. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, also, if you want to support me further, you can go to YouTube and subscribe. You can leave me comments. A lot of times the Guests will go back and look at the comments and interact. You can also join the Facebook group, Parker's Pensies Pensiers. And uh, a lot of the guests are in there as well. And there's some really good conversation happening as I speak right now. Uh, And then third uh, or fourth, above and beyond, you can go over to Apple Podcasts, leave me a five-star review and a comment that will help trick the algorithm into thinking this is an awesome podcast. So please go and do that. Uh, Without further ado, let's pull Dr. Brian Orr in. Brian, man, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, Parker. Thank you so much. I'm very excited about this. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, man. So I I had a look at uh, one of your papers and really exciting stuff, man. And I thought I haven't done, I don't think I've ever done anything on creation ex nihilo. So this is really fun to uh, to get your paper and and to jump in. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your areas of, of, of interest before we jump in? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a bivocational pastor, which means I'm, I'm a pastor for basically free, and then I have a, a professional job in the workforce. I'm not a teacher or anything, but uh, I am a uh, operations manager for supply chain in the uh, Walmart, the company of Walmart. And so I've been doing that oh, for nice. years, and love my job. Gives me a lot of time off. I, mean, I was able to do a PhD by working full time. Uh, you know, I'm 42 years old, so I went to school kind of later in life, and uh, just been a really, really good blessing. But so yeah, so pastor, and then I'm also the founder and managing editor of the Journal of Classical Theology, hoping to have our first volume out in fall of 2022. Dang, that's awesome. Is there, a, is there a theme on that, or is it just classical theology in general for that first one? So, I mean, pretty much the focus will be on doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ. And so I really want this journal to embody pretty much the, basically the, the greatest minds on classical theism, uh, but also I want classical theism to be more than just something we discuss in the ivory tower and, and debate there. I yeah. want all to be there, but also to influence down to the pews, because uh, honestly, this world needs a big God, and that's mm. what the God of classical theism is. Yeah. Man, that's huge. That's awesome. So um, oh. how'd you how'd you end up getting a, a PhD in, in theology, and, and who'd you do that? I know who you did that under, but yeah. uh, tell, tell the audience first. Yeah, so the story is really cool. Um, I was planning on going to a different school, didn't work out, and I thought, you know what, let me just submit my... Um, Kind of my, my thesis proposal to London School of Theology, and I had to go there because again I'm bivocational, mm-hmm. and this is one of the one of the you know good good schools offering a degree that was distance that was I had to be there, and so I just kind of sent it in, uh, see if they accepted it, and before I know it, they called me up, had an interview, and they told me we're going to take you on, and you're going to have Paul Helm and Tony Lane, and I was just not even expecting it. I was like, wow, okay, I'm reading these guys' books and reading their papers, and then now they're my supervisor, so it was kind of a really neat neat deal how it all worked out. Yeah. So what would you end up? Um, is it is it called a thesis over there, or is it called a dissertation? It is a thesis. So there's thesis here. It's dissertation. Like their actual undergraduate, they call dissertation dissertations. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So it's a thesis, and um, originally my my plan was to do some more work in the area of of open theism. Um, it's kind of weird. I I kind of have a personal journey to that, to where I it sounds kind of strange, but I, I I lost a friendship over open theism many years ago. And I was just so distraught by it. Um, I just like, you know what? I want to engage in this. I want to get get down in it and really just kind of, I don't know, I could say I had a vendetta against it, if you will. Sure. 
And so I'll let to say I went this route actually through a um, uh, suggestion by a guy named Stephen Edgar, who is kind of good friends with uh, John Sanders, who's one of the well-known open theists. And yeah. uh, he mentioned about Ord. Now it's funny. My last name is Orr. His yep. last name is Ord. Uh, so there's a distinction there. And, that D uh, makes a big difference though. Yeah, it does. It does. So I just started reading his stuff. I never even heard of him until, until that point. And I just saw there's a lot of opportunity to engage with, with Ord's work because I think it is the most advanced and consistent model of open theism. That has actually moved into a, well, I think, a more of a, a Protestant liberal arena, but he is claiming to be evangelical because he has like a Wesleyan background and that kind of thing. And there are definitely some distinctions which keep him from being a you know complete you know Protestant liberal kind of uh, pers persuasion. So that's where I ended up with him. And and again, it's one of those things where you know most people I think do a PhD on someone who's dead. Yeah. Or it is alive and kicking, and we've had a lot of discussions. I've talked to him in person, and uh, he's a really actually really nice guy. Okay. Yeah, I have heard that about him. I, I did some work on his work against uh, Dr. Van Hooser when I was writing my thesis um, and trying to give uh, Van Hooser's authorial analogy uh, a defense against Ord because Ord's kind of like the, the love guy, right? Like he really emphasizes love. Yeah, and Van Hooser calls him, you know, the love theologian. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that, that must be in there from the from the who's in my time with him. Yep. So yeah, that's what, that was part of the reason I, I found your paper so interesting because uh, we're, we're taking up Thomas Ord's theory of uh, creation. Maybe he wouldn't call it his own, but it, I think it, that's fair. Before we, before we jump in, um, yeah. man, what is creation ex nihilo for, for people who don't, aren't familiar with that terminology? Yeah. So, I mean, creation ex nihilo is the longstanding doctrine of creation for the historic Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really, the, the term speaks of, of God's creative act of bringing being into existence from, from nothing, but specifically that God creates all things through himself, from himself, like we see in John 1, 3. Um, and he does not for me kind of like pre-existent uh, materials or matter, that kind of thing, but he brings it through, through, through speaking. That's what the ultimate doctrine of ex nihilo is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this, but I've, I've heard people, I don't know if it's nitpick or or whatever, it's probably really important, but talking about creation out of nothing, nothing versus creation into nothing. You familiar with that, that kind of terminology? People will say, well, no, it's technically creation into nothing because he didn't use nothing to create something. What, what do you make of that? Yeah. So I think, I think that is part of the issue too with the critics is, is the term. Like we're not, they're not using the right term. As far as the into nothing, I can't speak to that, but the out of nothing in a sense or from nothing, the idea that God creates but the idea of, of being from non-being obviously really makes no sense. That's the mm -hmm. big hang up. That okay, there was nothing, and from that nothing, whatever nothing is, then God now pulls something out of it and makes it. Yeah. The whole point is to safeguard God and say he doesn't create from anything outside of himself. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's the proper understanding of ex nihilo that is, I think is honestly honestly is, is overlooked, not understood, which ultimately these guys that are critics kind of come to conclusions based upon a faulty understanding of the of the term. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it's still it's still a tricky doctrine, right? Because it's like us finite beings who we. I like Tolkien's phrase that uh, we're all sub creators. We have to create under the great creator because none of us can create ex nihilo. No, um, we can't even create a grain of sand. No, and so it's crazy to, to think like, okay, all this came, but it wasn't like from. It's not like God is made of like play doh and then pulls some of himself off and then creates. It's not like that, you know. It's like he just he spoke things into being and. I'm, I, mean, I was super influenced by Van Hoos, so I got like the speech act model in my head. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, I think I like Van Hoos' work on that. It's really helpful. One thing I, I think, obviously, the, the doctrine is incomprehensible, right? Yeah. But there's, there's, a, there's a creaturely analog to it in a sense. This is a, a very, very, you know, what's it called? Um, rough sense that, you know, in my mind right now, I can, I can look out in front of me and I can actually picture balloons in front of me. Right. Right. I can do that. My mind in that context and that creaturely realm, I can create, in a sense, ex nihilo from my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. And see these things. Yeah. God's obviously uh, transcendent and omnipotent power can bring it into true being. Right. Yeah. My, my thoughts are already in being. I'm just kind of sense, you know, creating it based upon from his knowledge. And uh, I mean, obviously, that ultimate point of, of non being to being is, yeah, there's no way to even speak about it to have any type of coherency. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah, and if, if we want to be like super duper technical or limit our, our 
our usage, yeah, we don't really ever create anything if creation is what, what God does, but we reorganize things out of pre-existing, even our thoughts. But, but like you said, I mean, Tolkien made a whole entire world out of his words, right? Yeah. And so um, authors do that all the time. And, and that's why we say that they're amazing authors. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that kind of brings us into uh, Ord's view. Um, and we're going to be covering this this paper that, that you're writing, critiquing him. And critiquing sounds harsh, but you know you do a great job of of also laying out his view um, and being kind about it and being accurate, and then saying here's some problems with it. So just real quick for those who uh, aren't in the theology realm, uh, like who who is Thomas Ord? Why should they care what what he has to say about this kind of stuff? Yeah, so Thomas Ord is, I would say. Kind of this is the most advanced, advanced theologian when it comes to open theism. He's got a, he considers himself evangelical. He has a Wesleyan heritage, mm -hmm. um, but he's a very strong process philosophical influence on his theology. Process philosophy, in a sense, is you know obviously would be, um, I would say that's even among open theism, they would say that process philosophy is definitely not Christian philosophy. There's yeah. definitely some distinctions, but you know that's up for another debate. But he is. A very provocative, very bold in what he says. He ultimately uh, affirms or he claims that God does not have sovereign unilateral power in any manner. Mm -hmm. And also he claims to have solved the problem of evil. I mean, yeah. it's pretty, pretty bold, right? So I mean, simply put, he says that there's things that God cannot do. And so he's willing to discard the doctrine of divine sovereignty because it diminishes God's love. I mean, his latest book that just came out was very popular. The book is called God Can't. I mean, mm -hmm. what about it get some attention, right? So it has to do with uh, understanding God when it comes to tragedy and that kind of thing and evil. But ultimately, his goal is to offer a doctrine of God, a, a theodicy, that God has no culpability for it whatsoever. And um, the word's been other other works that come out from him is uh, the, the the five the five views books, the multi view books. Like he's done that for the problem of evil and impassibility, two recent ones that kind of came out. So he's in there. And then his his most popular book is The Uncontrolling Love of God by IVP. It came out in 2015, and in 2016 it received the uh, IVP Reader's Choice Award. So he's got he's got influence. I mean, he speaks all over the world. Uh, he's a great speaker. I think he's just he's able to take these concepts and make them very just you know chewable for a lot of people, and people like that, you know. And uh, like I said, I think he he needs attention because he's the most advanced version of open theism, where he's willing to part ways from the original founders of it on these doctrines as far as creative ex nihilo in divine sovereignty like open theists hold those things they just have it kind of in a, in a modified sense when it comes to sovereignty but the, the ex nihilo is like a foundational doctrine or it's like it's unbiblical we got to get away from it because it's still tie it still makes god arbitrary and that's the kind of big the main point in the paper too, to kind of um evaluate that yeah yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll Let's go, Let's go into, into um, some, some of those, those criticisms, criticisms that, that he brings up. So, so, yeah, why why should we reject? Why does Ord think that we should uh, reject creation ex nihilo? Besides the, our, well, you can you can flesh out the arbitrariness as well. Yeah. So um, he ultimately rejects it because one, he thinks the early church adopted it for two reasons: one, to disassociate God from matter, and to reconcile Christian theism with an omnipotent God. And again, obviously, I said. The view of, of power, divine power, is different when it comes to process philosophy compared to we would say of our, you know, our classical Christian Christian philosophy, that kind of thing. But um, so, or looks at the scriptures. He's in that kind of minority camp, or that very beginning phrase in Genesis, right? As far as the the formless void, that that word to, uh, tohu abohu in, in the Hebrew yeah. has been translated as primordial chaos or shapeless mass and that kind of thing. So therefore. It becomes a very kind of literal sense where God is actually refashioning this chaos and he's giving shape to something that's already there. Um, also, to the, the, you know, in the beginning, God created, well, the minority position sees that as a temporal clause. So they would say it is when God began. And mm -hmm. so that kind of creates, like, in the same point that there is a temporal piece to creation. And because of these things, and there's other passages that Ward goes through in the New Testament um, that he thinks that, that support X and the Hilo, he ultimately thinks they just do not. And ultimately, therefore, because of God's love and what scriptures do talk about them, um, it is unscriptural to hold ex nihilo, nihilo as, as a viable doctrine. Um, now, the arbitrary piece of it is we'll kind of get into is that if if God creates ex nihilo by his will, right, that means it could have been just as easily for God to not create. Yeah. For him, because God's nature is love, and love for or isn't just an attribute of attributes, it's the primary metaphysical foundation of what God is and who God is. Mm -hmm. So therefore, 
His love means he's essentially relational. He has to have always had a creation to relate with. And I think you, you heard me right, a creation. Yeah. So he even makes it that kind of that kind of basic because it's, it's, it's part of who God is. So therefore, ex nihilo will completely compromise and sever that relation. And that's what Ord thinks that is not part of, is not proper in God's love, and therefore it needs to be abandoned. Well, is, I don't know if I've ever thought about this uh, concerning Ord's theology. Is he not a, a Trinitarian? No, interesting. It's funny you say that. So he is, and he also rejects social Trinitarianism. Okay. So you, so because he rejects social Trinitarianism, he, he wouldn't find like a, <clears throat> a strong distinction between <clears throat> the persons of the Trinity. Because like Swinburne will go that route and say, God is essentially loving because there's three centers of consciousness in God and God can, you know, <clears throat> the father and the, the son can love each other. And the third, the, the, the binding is like a, a person himself. It's the spirit. And so, or rejects that and says, no, we have to have a creation for God to love uh, for e eternally because he, he can't love himself. Yeah. So my dissertation kind of goes into that because I really, I mean, just to kind of backtrack. So my dissertation was really aimed at, at Ord's model being kind of a foil to where I looked at a, at a current kind of, you know, Christian, Christian theistic model that, retains these classical doctrines of you know, the divine trinity um uh, simplicity and doctrine of creation and I, and I look at okay this is a system of theology that's holding these key doctrines but what it's doing is it's actually uh swapping out classical metaphysics mm -hmm. with process metaphysics and trying to retain the framework to those same doctrines that classical metaphysics was incorporated in establishing for the christian christian uh, tradition right yeah is it consistent? And ultimately, my, my, my thesis demonstrated that it wasn't at the end. Ord's, Ord's uh, commitment to process philosophy and process metaphysics always had the upper hand. So basically, it was the handler, right, of his theology instead of the handmaiden to it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so, really... Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, that's that's super important. I, I wonder... Um, so you've, you've talked with Ord. Um, does he actively acknowledge that he's pulling from process theos, uh, process um philosophy from like you know uh Al alfred north whitehead and those kind of cats or is it just like uh he doesn't acknowledge that and says no i'm not like those guys oh no i mean he he did his phd at, at claremont school of theology which is i'm sorry claremont sorry claremont, claremont graduate school which is a a bastion of process process metaphysics i mean that's it's really kind of the main hub of it so he ultimately part of his his trek to process philosophy is he just did not see the the traditional christian doctrine of god was mm -hmm. satisfying to the God of love that he sees in the Bible and ultimately this arbitrary God that he sees and thought process philosophy in a sense, you know, makes up that gap and better accounts for that. So he definitely went that route because of wanting to have a doctrine of God that was, was more um, intellectually, psychologically and, and scripturally satisfying when it comes to God's divine nature of love. Okay. Yeah. So it is an active thing he's doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, it's pretty wild, man. I, 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 I want to like caution the listeners that before you just go, you know, ham on, on Ord and say, what an idiot, holy cow. Like you put, put yourself in, in, in his shoes from his lenses and see like he's elevating love and he's saying God is love. And he takes that very seriously. And if you were to take that and elevate that above any other attribute of God, it, it can make sense. Like you can look down, you know, through his lens and see why he's doing that. Um, and you can still say, I think it, that's crazy, you know, but, but do the hard work of, of following his line of thought instead of just what an idiot. Holy cow, man. I hate this guy. <laughs> you know, so I think that's, that's, that's what we're going to do here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's funny you say that because uh, my first time visiting actually meeting order in person, I think it was about probably a year, a half, year and a half into my work. And, and my Tony Lane, one of my supervisors, he said, just remember when you see Ord, he is not the devil incarnate. <laughs> and, and because that, because again, it's, it's kind of those things to where, you know, I wasn't doing this as just a, an academic exercise, right? Like to me, this actually has a very kind of, there's a personal element to it that I, it really is part of my convictions, right? I mean, right. I focus on them as I'm very convinced about the importance of classical theism and the problem that I see in, in modern theology is just very unsettling for me. For me, it is, and so I had to kind of re remain that way. And Ord was so charitable to me, even though, I mean, let's just say this: when I, my ultimate goal was to have him 
read my thesis and kind of give his stamp of approval on it. And he couldn't even, he couldn't get through it. He couldn't, because it was, it was very, very critical. Mm. And, um, but ultimately, you know what? I, I thanked him for his, his time. I thanked him for the help in it. And so he's a very nice guy, very, very nice gentleman. And so I appreciate the time of that. But yeah, at the end of the day, I, I think he's just, com he's completely wrong, completely yeah. wrong. Yeah. And so, I, oh, yeah, well, I like that, man. I think that's important to be able to say that about people today, right? Like, Hey, this is a nice guy and yeah, we can, we can agree on some stuff, but like ve vehemently oppose what he's doing and think that if it spreads throughout the church, it's actually a big problem. Yes. And yet, you know, I like the guy, but I don't like his views. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, that's cool. Um, well, so let's let's talk about his view, um, specifically the name. I don't know how to pronounce that, but uh, can you can you list what he calls uh, what he, yeah, the the term he gives his doctrine. So his term, yeah, creatio ex creatione uh, natura amoris, which a friend of his helped him come up with that term. But basically, it says that God always creates out of creation with the nature of love. And so his his all kind of his whole you know embodying doctrine about this is that that God has been creating creatures from an everlasting chain consisting of creatures and universes, mm -hmm. universes, right? So not maybe specifically this one, but God has always been creating. Now his view of time is different. He's more of a temporalist in that kind of standpoint, that God is everlastingly moments by moments having successions of time, which basically process metaphysics is all about becoming, right? So definitely that fits in line with that metaphysics. So, and, and with open theism, right? Like if you're an open theist, you kind of have to be an atheist about time. That only the present moment exists. Yeah, there's some there's some distinctions there, we, even within that. But, um, I mean, Ord is, uh, you know, univocal in all of his theology, all of his statements, for sure. He sees it as a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And time is that same way. God is just, again, part of it in a manner to where he's all-encompassing and he moves along with with, with creation. Okay. With his ultimate purposes. But, yeah, that's, that's important. And then... Um, so God continues to create out of what's he already what he's already created, but in my thesis again I don't want to I don't want to go into it too much here, but I really kind of show the how the philosophical concept of that is really is really inconsistent. It, it kind of is, and Ord's statements are they kind of go against, go against each other, and you can kind of see it easily. But but his whole point though is that he he holds his view because of his interdependence with creation, right? It, it guarantees this relationship with creation. It guarantees that God will always love, and Ord says. Quote, God must love, right? God must love. Now, obviously, we'd say God must be holy. I mean, we know those things like that, right? But how Ord, in a sense, defines love and how he suits it to God's creation, his relation to it, um, is very, very different than an ex nihilo view would, would have it. And so that's the kind of the key things that he's always been creating out of what he's been, what he created in the past, and God is relational with it. So it's always this kind of relational dynamic with God and creation, which in my thesis I do kind of show as a, as a as, as a problem when it comes to the creator creature distinction, and also Ord's view of divine, um, sorry, of, of of the Trinity, because in a sense, what I show in my thesis is that um, Ord's doctrine of God does not need a Trinity doctrine to be there. And that's yeah. like huge. Like he, in a sense, the way he presents it, there is no need for that. He affirms it, but there's no actual need for God to be Trinitarian in Ord's doctrine of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but did, does he continue to have a like uh, a strong role for um, revelation in his theology? No, because revelation isn't something that that we see as a a, a supernatural divine act. Even supernatural mm -hmm. in that sense, or does not hold to that term because God is ultimately always acting with his creation. So that's not really a supernatural act. There is no distinction that, that humanity has fallen and needs revelation from God. God is is distinctly tied to his creation. So there isn't that there isn't that segregation. Now he would say obviously that God is distinct from creatures. Okay. He definitely would say that. I, I think it's I think it's a challenging claim to make based upon his his his, his um his commitments to process metaphysics. But you know, I'll leave that there for now. But um yeah, the, the ultimate the ultimate point of revelation is, is not as we would see it from a classical view. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, the creatio ex creatione a natura amoris, this the God's always creating out of creation uh, with the nature of love. That's more of like what we were talking about earlier with being sub creators that like, you know, we, we don't always do out of love, but we can never create out of nothing. We have to use what's already pre-existing. Yep. And so 
for, for the listeners, you know, God is, is there and there's this clay that's always been there that he just continues to shape, but he, and he has this relationship with it is, I, I did a lot of work on Philip Clayton at the same time as Thomas Ward. And I can't remember. Um, they, they like mixed together for me. I can't remember. Is, is, does Ord have a, a panentheism in there? I know Clayton does, but yes. Yeah, he, he does. Um, okay. He retains, you know, kind of back to the whole point about matter, like he, where he'll say in one sense there was a, there was an initial act of God creating, but then he says that God has always been creating. Yeah. But you look at those statements and it's kind of like, uh, which one is it? But he kind of reverts to that, hey, it's incomprehensible, but so is ex nihilo. Uh, therefore, we can use it. And I think even Aquinas at one point mentioned about matter it could be eternal. Um, I don't recall exactly, but ultimately, at the end of the day, what it says it's not is scripture. I mean, scripture is a, is a kind of defining factor of that. So that's where the revelation piece comes into guide our theology. Okay. Yeah. The, I, I know um, some neoclassical theists uh, like Ryan Mullins might, might say, you know, this is uh, what's, what's sauce for the goose is also sauce for the gander here for the, for the classical theist who wants to affirm a, an eternal creation to, to help with the arbitrariness so that in, in that sense, uh, creation has always been being created. I don't know. It's I know it's uh, it's it's tricky stuff. I know that a classical thesis doesn't want to affirm that, but just wanted to bring that up because I know some some of the neoclassical guys listening might say, "Well, that's you know, too quoque." You you also, yeah, yeah. And I think I think they tend to go that way because again, we're going back to the idea of creation, right? From non-being. I mean, mm -hmm. it is incomprehensible. Mm. So when we, when we struggle with trying to make sense of that language and try to, we affirm it's mysterious, but then we try to make a, a caveat about what it might be, how it could be, our mind can't comprehend it. And so therefore there's that, there's that, I think there's that tendency to want to lean towards a doctrine that we can have some explanatory power to, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, you can't even fathom what that means because if, if you go back to saying creation's eternal, but you recognize there's a distinction with it and God's eternal. And what does that relation look like? It's like you kind of keep going back and back and back, and you're, you're going to get back into to, to a situation where again you're it's it's it lacks explanatory power, but you're going to hold it out of arbitrariness because we can't see how it could be any other way by what we see in our in a, you know before us in our experience. Yeah, I, I think that's what I what I definitely appreciate about classical dudes like yourself is. Um, Strong, like creator creature distinction. I think that's a really important thing. And, and uh, analogical predication and saying, look, there's some mystery here because God is ontologically different than us. And I always uh, appreciate that. I also think that while this is incomprehensible, um, it still has, I think it still has way more explanatory power than the, the universe creating itself in some kind of. Um, uh, panpsychism, you know, yeah. cosmo panpsychism, or uh, just like Big Bang cosmology without going a step further and saying, you know, the nothing actually was something. Like, well, okay, at least here we still have an agent, rational, creator, all powerful God who's creating. It just it's hard for us to understand how or yeah, yeah, you know, out of what, but out out of nothing, right? And it's not he's not borrowing from his own. I think he's borrowing from his own being. Um, no, it's yeah, it's the manifestation of his divine ideas into the created reality. I mean, that's that's what it is. And that's where, again, it goes back to Revelation. It yeah. Was, it speaks of God being transcendent. And he's, he's using creaturely language to explain to us what his act of creation is in a manner that we can comprehend and understand. I mean, we, like I said, we can, we can understand that our, that our ideas, we can create something in our mind with our ideas. Like, we can yeah. get, we do that, right? But, again, the, the concept of a balloon I have doesn't come from me. Yeah, This comes from God's ideas, God's manifestation of his uh, unfathomable mind into the created reality that we live in. And then by that experience in that creaturely world, we produce these ideas. And in a sense, we kind of can speak our ideas into existence in our mind and then also right. creating things uh, with, with the material around us. Totally. Um, I, I love that. Just a, a, a random one for you. There's not a ton at stake here, and it's pretty speculative. But in your mind, is God making things up, or is he looking inward and, you know, uh, every his ideas are kind of exemplars uh, from his own being? Or did he, like like a giraffe, you know, did, that, did he look inward and find some kind of giraffeness, or, or did he just come up with the idea of a giraffe? 
You're trying to suck me into your previous podcast, huh? <laughs> well, dude, you might as well. We're already here. You know, I want to say I want to sound like an idiot, but ultimately, you know, I haven't I haven't thought too much on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that you know my my area expert expertise is it, it doesn't allow me to go that far philosophically speaking, right? I think it's yeah. fascinating. I have to kind of get into it, but I I, I just I, I would say that. I think the exemplar piece of it, and I may be even not even speaking in proper terms, but for God to be infinite in his mind, his wisdom, his knowledge means that he is the, the treasury of all ideas. Or he's the treasury of all things. And ultimately that knowledge is manifested in Christ. Mm -hmm. And for what God creates is a continual, just it's an act of, of God presenting himself to creatures in being able to glorify him into a manner that just, just shows us how unfathomably depth, how unfathomably deep God's mind is. The fact that, I mean, back to a giraffe. I mean, the fact that God knew that if it goes to drink water, its brain will explode because the blood will rush, rush to it and, and kill it. So what's he going to do? He put sponges in there to hold the blood back from his brain. Like, I mean, just. Dude, I didn't know that. Genius. Holy cow. Absolutely genius. So, yeah, yeah, so God's understanding of a giraffe was way beyond even what we could even think it would be. Yeah, that is crazy. I would have killed the giraffe if I just if I <laughs> if I designed it that things die for sure. Yeah, and just think, wow. a giraffe would never be able to evolve, right? Because as soon as it comes out, it goes down to drink. Bam, his brain explodes and it's done. Yeah, right. It seems like an irreducibly complex type of type of thing that that he needs sponges, otherwise he can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's crazy. All right, okay. So, um, yeah, that that one was just for free. Um, cool. uh, okay, well, so help help us think through like why might. I don't like, I, like intuitively, this does not work for me at all. And um, I'm a Calvinist and I'm pretty hardcore. I'm wearing a Calvinist shirt right now. Like um, the love thing doesn't get me because I know that I'm a worm and it's like, dude, he loves me and didn't destroy me and he should have, but he didn't. Um, but like, why, why might someone find Ord's um, view of creation more satisfying uh, than creation ex nihilo? Like, can, can you help motivate that for us? Yeah, you know, in in modern biblical studies, um, the tendency is, has been to look at the creation accounts. So it'd be Genesis specifically. Look at the creation accounts within the ancient Near Eastern context, which is you know, which is fine. I, I get there's a need for it. Now I'm not a biblical studies guy, but just from what I've read, it seems like the tendency is that okay, because we've we look at this context of, of various ancient Near Eastern religions, all kind of speaking on a on a, on a similar similar manner that we must interpret the Genesis account within that context. Yeah. So what happens is, in a sense, is that now God is just a God among gods. Mm -hmm. And instead of looking at the creation account and realizing that really the, the creation accounts, which obviously none of the other ancient areas and religions really have a type of creation account like God does, God is presented as the one that created everything, and he restored chaos. I'm sorry, he restored the chaos to an unorderly manner. But when you look at the actual ancient Near Eastern accounts, they're all about chaos. They're all about gods fighting each other and having sex and creating this weird baby and all kinds of weird stuff, right? That came to creation. They're yeah, very making the making the universe out of someone's you know corpse and yeah, 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 all kinds of weird stuff. And so what's happening is that there's a ten, the tendency has been is to to keep to keep that 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 doctrine of creation. I'm sorry, doctrine of creation within that context and leave God there and say we must interpret it in light of that. Now, now I know there's scholars that don't do that. You know, they're very, very good. And so I'm not going to you know make this kind of broad claim. But I think that is the problem. So what's happening is that as that's be kind of come this trend in modern biblical studies, as it's kind of seeped in theology, you see guys thinking, wow, OK, that's actually the more biblical view of it because it's more of a literal, you know, a literal understanding of that. Instead of actually looking at the account, as we see in Genesis 1 and John 1, as correctives. Yeah. Correctives of the, the origin of the universe. So, so Genesis 1 is the corrective of the ancient Near Eastern context. And then John one, right, is the the Greco-Roman context, right? Because yeah. the, the Logos speaks and the fact that it, that the, the creation account now is presented where in the beginning God created, but now we see in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now we see there's two persons in there, two mm -hmm. persons involved in creating, and the Son isn't just this instrument. The Son is from the Father, thus He has the same essence, and therefore John now kind of now addresses addresses this context about about origins. Yeah, that's a really good point. That uh, each each creation account, old and new, still has the context, but they're correctives. See, I again, man, this is why it just doesn't move me because I've always seen that as a really important distinctive in Christianity uh, and and in Judaism. Saying, yeah, 
this one's different than all the rest. Yeah, you have Marduk and you have all these pre-existing things, but you don't have any explanation for where the buck stops. Yes. And we have that. And so I just, I don't know why, I I don't know what it would take for me to be like, yeah, okay, I'll go this route and give up the distinctives that we've had this whole time that we've been emphasizing that church fathers have emphasized forever and just say like, oh no, let's, let's situate this in its context and then flatten out the distinctives to, you know, find them that the similarities that it just, it seems like you're punting on our uh, inheritance, you know? Yeah, we, we are. And I think that's the, you bring the important point is that, is that the problem is, you know, modern, modern theology, just pretty, pretty much just, just you know, obviously modernity in general, it's become a historical, right? The idea of looking back to the past, these guys have no idea what they're talking about. We so don't, don't even actually really read them or even read them in their context, right? So what happens is that we don't look to the past and we look at kind of more of the, the socially oriented philosophy of our time um, has a huge, huge kind of grasp on theology, on biblical studies, right? It really has, has kind of pressed it in a direction that the culture wants to go. Hmm. So as you and I, I'm a committed Calvinist. We look at scripture and we have no problem with what the Bible says as far as God having an elect group that he specifically chose by his divine grace. Right. Well, the problem is that you have those that, that see that as being so off-putting because now God is arbitrary, right? God is arbitrary in picking one over the other. Mm-hmm. But as you can tell, that distinction in itself, that thought is completely uh, in violation of, of who God is because God is not arbitrary, but because those that are, that, that are critics of it cannot cannot see that. Again, they, they see the problem. They want to actually put a, put a nail, a hammer on it and, and stamp it out. So they're actually discerning, right, discerning, the, t- the text and discerning these views is like, you know what, because God's love, he has to love everybody equally. Yeah. And because that's so we're going to reject certain things. We're going to reject some of these things. And the creator creature distinction is become under fire for that. Because again, the same day, God then has a mind of his own and that's a problem. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, I, I think Van Hooser section in his book was really good on the, um, What's the big book he wrote? I loved it. I forget the name of it. Which one, man? There's so many big ones. Re, uh, re, remythologizing theology. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. my favorite. Re- you know, that's a word I can never say. Remythologizing. I, I hate that word. I, I think I had word. to ask him remyth- remythologizing because I was saying in my head wrong for like two years. Yeah. Yes, it is a, a funky term, and so you know he did a good job of, of showing that relational term in modern theology, and, it, and again, it goes down to that that it's the it's the philosophical commitments. And the ultimate um, roadblocks that people these days cannot get past. Yeah, that's the issue. It goes to that, not not the scriptural argument, not the theological argument. It's the philosophical commitment to an understanding of what a person is, of what human nature is, of what divine a divine being should be. I mm-hmm. mean, I just preached uh, a few weeks ago on the doctrine of divine aseity, right? And from the pulpit, that was that was fun. It was it was a good sermon. Yeah. But the whole thing is that that is, is part of it is that there's this inherent understanding of how a divine being should be. And therefore, that's more of a projection of man onto God instead of the understanding that, hey, we are distinct from God. And that's that's a big that's a big area of tension in our in our modern context. Yeah, I think that's true. I think I think uh, we do have a tendency to try and hammer out the mystery to get to um like, man, I, I kind of chafe a little bit when I hear univocal because I've studied uh uh, just so many theologians who are like, no, dude, analogy. Um, yeah. Like yeah. Van Til has hammered it a ton. Uh, I think Van Hoos does a really good job of it. Um, but yeah, so there, there are a lot of modern philosophers and a lot of my friends who who say there's nothing wrong with being univocal when talking about God. And I'm like, dude, ah, that's so terrifying. And they go, yeah, but there's got to be a univocal core. And so I, I, I did some work on uh, analogy trying to figure out what the heck analogical predication is and it's a way to speak literally about god but not yeah. univocally and um so i i have no problem with I, I think we actually really need that um yes as long as we operate it operate with it in in proper terms like there's a there's a divine grammar that we have to use that was what really the early church fathers in a sense kind of had to hammer out is, is this grammar that says what's biblical in a manner using terms that the bible doesn't use all right and that yeah. comes against you know and you know challenging the 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 rivaling ideologies and the, and the uh, religions of the day is okay. These are these are attacks on the God of the Bible. We need to be able to speak coherently and cogently without flattening out, right? Without flattening out who God is in a manner that can actually 
in a sense, make sense of reality, make sense of how we see things. But I mean, again, if we if we go completely completely univocal, there's all kinds of issues that we run into. And the biggest one is that we ultimately end up denying key doctrines the Bible teaches about God. And that's yeah. that's a problem if you go too far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad. So the reason I asked you about Ord, um, Ord being self-consciously, uh, self-consciously appropriating from process theism or, you know, being in the tradition of process theism by borrowing from process philosophy is because a lot of times um, I've seen theologians kind of toss the philosophy card at each other where the, the neoclassical guys will say, you, you're working with ancient metaphysics that are outdated in, in your Aristotelianism or your Platonism. And, you know, that's actually Gnosticism. And then the, the uh, classical guys saying, hey, look, you guys are all, you know, influenced by, by Hegel, which maybe in, in Europe, but then here, you know, like even, even Paul Helm, like uh, co he comes at Van Hooser pretty hard mm -hmm. saying like, you are, yeah, you're appropriating um, process theism un unbeknownst to you and your speech act stuff. Uh, yeah. Your speech act metaphysics is no good. Yeah. And just like really hammers him. And I still need to read. Um, and I thumbed through it, but I need to go in and, and uh, see Helm's criticism a little bit more because when Helm criticizes someone, it's it's a terrifying thing. You should especially, take that seriously, especially when, especially when it's a three part series on his on his blog site. Oh yeah, yeah, well, he's got that whole book that he wrote. I think mostly against Van Hoos, but yeah, the the blog as well. Oh, that's funny. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, you bring up an important point, right? And I think, and this is what my what my thesis dissertation really kind of aimed at and demonstrated is that we can throw around the types of philosophies that we all schedule is we all have a metaphysic of what we of what we utilize, right? We all do. Yeah. But I think one of the, the test case for is okay, this where it goes back to the importance of Christian tradition. Right? Mm -hmm. These uh, these ideas, these doctrines that the church has formulated historically, um, they they have retained they've retained dominance for key reasons because they comport with the biblical data. And so the problem is that you you have you have philosophies coming out that tend to say that we make a better a better vision of God. It makes a, a God more comprehensible. Whatever you want to say, at the end of the day, is that can your metaphysical framework uphold right uphold these cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith consistently as the metaphysics that was utilized to establish them? Yeah. And that's the problem. That's why, like process philosophers that are that are theologians in the Christian tradition. They have very their doctrine of the Trinity is is not good. It's 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 very minimal, right? Their Christology is really weak too. And even the guys that have ventured out to try to um, formulate a somewhat consistent uh, Christological perspective, or even just the various views of the Trinity, they've even been they're even considered to be on the on the fringe of process philosophy because where they have to go yeah. to affirm those doctrines starts pushing them out of process metaphysics, and that's what happens. You have to ultimately leave those things because you understand that these Christian doctrines are don't cannot be substituted, mm -hmm. and you have to retain the metaphysics that that has a framework for these things, in a sense, to be part of the Orthodox Christian tradition. Yeah. And that's and that's where they all go bankrupt. That's where they all end up becoming counterfeit is they cannot uphold those. They try to, and ultimately they fail in the end because the metaphysical view at the end is the dominant hand in the theological formulation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so going back to to uh, to Ord's contention about pre-existing material, like I think of, I think of like Aristotle's prime mover, and I, I think that's kind of the view of the prime mover that he didn't create the stuff, but he is. All things are moving towards him, and is what is that primordial stuff for Ord? Like, is it is, is it mad? Like. Where did it come from? Did it emanate from God? It just always been there. Is there any explanation for that? Yeah, I mean, there's not really an explanation for it other than that it's always been there. I mean, when it comes to you know the the metaphysics of process philosophy, you know there there is more there there are more hinged upon focused upon experience in okay. relations, right? Not yeah. so much like substance ontology, but relations. So within the context you know, that God has this, has this interrelated interrelatedness to creation. As far as what that actual primordial stuff is, because God even or even says God didn't just kind of stumble upon some pre-existing material and start making from it. He, he he affirms it. He says that's not the case. But then when you actually see him flesh out his his doctrine of creation, you're kind of left with like, okay, so what, what is it? And it's really kind of unsatisfying. Mm -hmm. But and or even says, hey, ex nihilo, right, is unexplainable. 
mine's in the same camp. So why would you not accept mine? <laughs> yeah, if it can, if it can more uh, readily or more ably make sense of love, and if it can uh, do a better job of solving the problem evil, then yeah, there might be a tie between being incomprehensible. But I've got more stuff going for me than creation ex nihilo. So come over. For sure. But at the end of the day, the, and, or that distinction ultimately shows the, the vast difference between the two, and the more consistency from a classical view is the biblical data. I, yeah. I mean, really, I, I don't, not even per se, like we can get into, you know, how a certain person interprets this one and that passage, but really looking at how, like, Ord handles scripture, it is, it is really on a, on a general revelation sense. Mm -hmm. Like there is no, there is no special revelation that creatures need right to in a sense come to god like that's just kind of a a god loves all type thing and so the problem is that you you end up jumping over passages that in a sense con contradict what you are actually teaching instead of trying to actually take those and somehow um not align but uh what's the word try to see how how your doctrine of god complements the passages with the scripture guiding that and like for example yeah. you know his view of love i really I, my, my thesis has a you know large chapter on that it does. It is not comprehensive enough, and that's the problem. Even you look at guys that have written have written tomes and works on the doctrine of love, they all say very clearly it is a multifaceted doctrine. There's so yeah. many elements to it. You can't just say one piece of it is actually the guiding principle in God's but divine nature. And I show that in my thesis. I mean, example, you know, Psalm 136 is a clear a clear psalm. I'm sorry, a key psalm on God's love, God's enduring love. And within that, you see it says, you know, God. God takes down kings. God kills, you know, uh, Israelites because God's love endures forever. God's love endures forever, right? So it's like, okay, he's doing these things for the sake of love, but Ord would never affirm that. Yeah, he, he would never try to see how that could fit into his view of God's love. He just goes around it, and that's the problem with, I would say, process philosophy is they, get, they go back to the philosophy. I mean, yeah. the whole point of process philosophy was to mitigate the Odyssey, was to mitigate God's involvement with evil whatsoever, because they understood. That when it comes to a an orthodox, you know, classical Christian view of God or traditional view, God stands behind evil in some asymmetrical manner. Yeah. And process philosophy says that cannot be because then if God is omnipotent, which means he has the power to prevent evil, and he doesn't do it. Therefore, he's culpable for it. And that is the ultimate key distinction between process metaphysics and classical metaphysics. Yeah, on, on process, especially in open theist uh, process uh, theology, God... Maybe God didn't know about it, and so he could take this risk because, well, if you have process theology, it's not even really taking a risk because there always just was creation anyways. And so it's not like he rolled the dice and said, maybe I'll create anyways. There's, no, there's always going to be creation. So you can do a lot to yeah, try and mitigate the problem of evil. I, you know, just it just diminishes it God and ruins you know your, your picture. That then God's not God anymore. Yeah, there's all kinds of just hazards by doing that instead of discerning it and trying to, in a sense, you know, create a, a, a dogmatic sketch of it in our you know contemporary times. It's like, hey, God can't, or it's like he can't, he can't do it because he even in his book, and I always I say, I say this all the time. He has a part where he says God cannot even stop a falling rock from killing somebody. Yeah. He lacks the ability to do because his his loving nature means he does not have the ability. It's not like he just chooses not to. He lacks the ability to impinge upon any type of free act that his creation or creatures do. He can't, because that's what it means to be loving. He, he's given that over to them uh, to have that ab ability, and all he can do is hopefully woo people into eternal bliss, as he as he says. Yeah. Van Hooser talks about that in his book, um, in Remythologizing Theology, and he says, you know, if because he gives a sketch of an authorial analogy, which I think is awesome, but he talks about... Um, the process theology, uh, the process theologian brings God into the book as a character. Um, so, so does a, a reformed theologian, but uh, the author is holy in the book now, and he's just another one of the characters inside the book. He doesn't stand outside, continuing to direct and guide the the plot of the story. I thought that was really helpful to to think through. Yeah, yeah, it is for sure. I remember, I remember seeing that. Yeah. Well, um, uh, dude, I love chasing rabbits here. Um, you talked about relational ontology and um, I don't, it depends on the day, uh, whether I'm a consider myself a classical or neoclassical uh, theologian. I got, I got a hodgepodge in there. I'm still working through and I'm, I'm doing it intentionally. You know, I'm trying to figure out what I, what I believe. Yeah. Um, but I wonder 
when it comes to like relational ontology, again, I have the neoclassical guy living in my head who's like, well, isn't that uh, the orthodox view of, or isn't orthodox, maybe that was a Freudian step. Isn't but, that the classical view of the Trinity that the, the persons of the Trinity are relations? Yeah. So the relations defines the distinct modes of the divine essence, right? So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, they're eternal, so there's no sequential order to them, but yep. they actually define who the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We know by those by those actual relations who they are. We would say that the persons are the relations, right? We would yeah. say that. So, and that's why I think Or doesn't ascribe to a social trinitarian view, which you think he kind of would. He wrote a he wrote a response to I think it was Keith Ward. We kind of interacted with some of his some of his ideas about that. I can't recall them exactly, but. Um, that's a lot of ord, ord, ward, or. That's a lot. <laughs> That's right. That's, good. That's right. Um, so, so back to the relational ontology piece. I, I think what is also overlooked, and I talk about it in my dissertation, is that, and it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's an astonishing concept. And it's funny. I, I heard this phrase, and then I used it, and I completely forgot who it was from, and then I remembered it again. And John Webster speaks about that, right? And Did you say Webster. John Webster. Okay, cool. John Webster, right? I mean, just uh, man. You know, good for him is with the Lord, but bad for us that the Lord took him soon. Because I mean, seriously, man, dude is a awesome. legend. Yeah, he absolutely is. And so, one thing he really hammers out very well, which I think is so overlooked, is that for God to be who He is for us, He has to be completely free from us. Hmm. Right. And so, when you hear that, you think, "Oh man, this is like God is definitely distant. He's he's frozen. He's static." But no, like the thing is that God's promises He cannot fulfill specifically to you and to I and to anybody else, if God has this independent relationship with creation, if yeah. he does. Because there, now that God has a need because he's tied to it, God cannot be free, right? To be thinking about right now, right now, divine omnip omnipresence means that God, Father, Son, and Spirit is completely holy here before you and for me. All of his presence is there, right? And so if God, in a sense, is, is attached to relation to creation in that manner, God has to move with creation in that manner to fulfill things. And according to a process metaphysic, God cannot override freedom. All he can do is kind of lure or persuade, right? But the thing in the scriptures, you don't see that. I mean, the, the view of, of the divine power you see is that God unilaterally determines events as he wants them to come to pass without, right, without uh, infringing upon human free will. Right? You ultimately choose yeah. those. Joseph and his brother. Perfect. I mean, uh, we always yeah. go to that, but it's, yeah, it's no, we go to that for a reason. That, that should be Genesis 50, right? 50 verse 19, 20. That should be the lens that you see all of God's divine activity in Scripture. And that's the lens you always go back to and filter it through. Right. And it just, you have to. You really do. If you remove that, you pretty much bankrupt the entire story of Joseph. You yeah. can really, because you, when you go through Joseph from 36 to, to 50, you're thinking to yourself, okay, they kept saying the Lord was with them. The Lord was with them. The Lord, it's like, Lord, weren't you with them when he got in trouble with Potiphar's wife? Why, right. why, why weren't you there with them? Yeah. What happened? I mean, and, and Joseph's like, I get it. I understand through God showing these things, he understood why this happened. So that's just a, a challenge that process philosophers and you know evangelical theologians in that kind of field really stumble with is being okay with that. Mm -hmm. trying to try in a sense, you know, put a, you know, they want to put a, I don't know, it's maybe kind of crude, but they almost want to put a leash on God. Yeah. I don't think you can. And you can't. And so the, the relationality that they, that, that, that comes from that tradition does, in a sense, on the surface to people, make God sound more loving mm -hmm. right it, it really does but we actually get to the biblical data of it and you'll work through it and work through some of these things you realize okay that if god is in, on the same level of created reality right he cannot do these things that scripture talks about mm -hmm. he can't you can't trust his promises and that's where you know or gets into the whole arbitrariness and i kind of go through and respond to that paper about how one can hold to a doctrine of ex nihilo and have no arbitrariness in god and that's what i, I kind of go through in that paper yeah, yeah. Um, just a, a comment on the the loving really quick. That I, I think that it does. It sounds more loving to uh, uh, particularly evangelical Christians in America and maybe some in the UK, um, yeah. but uh, probably not in the Middle East, right? <laughs> Where we just have different conceptions of loving uh, a parent loving a child and the yeah. discipline at play and. How a loving, you know, reading Proverbs, how a loving father will discipline his child. And so just like, I feel that. And, and when I am drawn to that, I do want to take a step back and say, like, what is love? And 
love is not just this sweet gooey like give me whatever i want and you know kill yourself doing it yeah um you know carson carson wrote the difficult doctrine of the love of god and, and goes through various types of of god's love and like you said earlier it's this variegated and, and and it's a complex thing and so yes god is love but it's not just the f- love that we think about when i love my wife or something you know or i love my dog and so um yeah man i'm with you on that and i i, I love it yeah you know, it comes down to you know the the root metaphors right so in the open relational view the root metaphor really is that that it's a parental child relationship that we've seen in the scripture that becomes what guides all interpretations but again you have to you can use it in a certain context, but you have to break away from that um, in, in order to interpret other con- other contexts, other passages faithful to what Scripture is saying. And that's why there's so many pieces to it. You have to try to really, in a sense, kind of, there's not one guiding principle other than, and I say this in my thesis, I, I do want to say the, un, the, the guiding principle to all of God's divine activity and what he does is for his glory. Mm-hmm. And the passages, and I, I show, I mean, there's a replete amount of passages that I show in my thesis about that because that's what ultimately at the end of the day we think i think we have to filter everything through and it's again people don't want to hear that people don't want to hear it's for god's glory they want to say what's in it for me it's not selfish right yeah it's like god god just this is all for him it's so selfish and you just pull like a little bit of jonathan edwards and just go yeah but that's the best thing for us man if he was for us uh ultimately and not for his own glory that'd be really a bad thing for us what kind of crazy helicopter parent could god be you know if he were like that Exactly, but but the the other side of it, which I think classical theology has has been making great strides and needs to always consider to emphasize, is that because God is who He is, He is imminently here with us. He's mm-hmm. directly involved with creation, right? I mean, you know, right. Acts seventeen twenty five, right? Though we live and move and have our being in God, right? He's not this distant this distant father figure that kind of you know left his child and went off to somebody else. Like God is intricately involved with creation, and that's where. That's where Ord is really good and strong at. Like he talks about that as far as like, that's why even Ord will say there's no supernatural act because that means now God has to insert himself. As if he weren't already here working. Yes. Yeah. yes. And that's a really strong point, which I think is it, it's important. I, you know, I, I preached on God's power a little while ago and kind of really talked about the pieces of, of, of God's involvement with creation. That I think it can get lost uh, when it comes to our classical view of God because we do want to really hate. I guess you could say kind of hit heavy on the the negative attributes and that kind of thing. And it's like, no, that just tells us what God is not. Like right. we, if we just do that, right? It's like saying that if I say you're not a mannequin, okay, what does that mean? Like right. you're not a mannequin. There's nothing positive that comes out of that. So we have to use the terms in the proper manner, which what happens is those terms become kind of like the fighting words because that are the terms that the relational theologians and, and philosophers are so against. And so we keep sticking on those things and don't really get to the positive things. Mm-hmm. It's important that we get there, and we got to affirm those to have this really, you know, well orbed view. Not orbed, not orb, but orbed, orbed, right? <laughs> okay. orbed, yeah. orbed view of God that Scripture um, reveals to us. Yeah, well, dude, see, this is why I love Van Hoos. So, like, for those who are who are tempted by by Ord's view, just pick up remythologizing theology. He he talks about this, and he says, "Look, yeah, divine inter- intervention's a, a tricky one, and it's what we were just talking about because it seems like." a deist God who also just punctures holes into his creation here and there. But instead interjection, you know, God interjects his word. He creates by his word. He upholds the world by his word. And yeah, he, he convinces people uh, by his divine speech acts. Like it's, it's good. Again, maybe Paul Helm has, uh, has nailed the the last nail in the coffin. I got to read that. But if you're thinking of going Thomas Orr's route, Try Van Hoos first. Yes. Yes. Try the rabbit. I will say this, and I, I'm going to say this, but I can't really, in a sense, I can't elaborate. I will say I read, I read Van Hooser's book twice. Loved it. But I will say this. I will say this. I was lit down at the end when it came to, in a sense, him trying to, I, I would say, add his nuance to the, to the divine sovereignty, human responsibility debate. I think I was a little let down, but I can't, again, it's been like three years, so I can't exactly say why it was now, but I remember thinking, man, like, okay, we got there and it, and it didn't like, it didn't pan out for me like I was hoping it would. But That's it was, hilarious. That's so funny. That's what I wrote my master's thesis on because I felt the same way. Uh, um, okay, cool, cool. But but not, not because I felt like he let me down. Well, because I thought, look, man, you have this really powerful tool even his own his own view of author- the authorial analogy 
is the best. Um, there's been some uh, modern philosophers, Christian philosophers, even Reformed the- uh, philosophers, who have used the authorial analogy really well. Yeah. But if they don't do it the way Van Hoos did it, then you do collapse everything down and you make God the author of evil. Yeah. And so I was just like, dude, Van Hoos has this like gem that he just did not uh, employ fully. And so I just put that in contact with modern, uh, epistemology and, and philosophy of, uh, free will literature. Oh, cool. And, uh, it was super fun. Cause it was like, Oh, look, it can do the work that I wanted to see him do with that. Yeah. And I told him, he's, I don't know how much I should say, but I told him he's got to use this in his new Providence book. And I really hope that he will, will grab that authorial analogy and all the tools he built up in that book and apply that in, in his Providence book that's coming out. I don't know when, but Hopefully oh, cool. soon. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I gave my thesis I think, last year, and he was mentioned about it would be helpful for his class on Providence. So I was in that class. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. So, so maybe it'll be in the book. That'd be kind of neat. Yeah, that'd be huge. That's awesome, man. That's really funny that you said that. I just got a huge kick out of it because I felt exactly the same way. Man. Well, I got to read that. I got to read it then, man. Yeah, I'll send it your way. Yeah, it'd be huge. Okay. Please do. Um, yeah. Well, dude, this has been huge. Um, I appreciate it. you in your paper you do go into um I think you pull out like Augustine some of the church fathers and you say like this this really is what the church believes we do believe in creation ex nihilo like and and then here's here's the the reasoning from the fathers and then here's scriptural reasoning for it as well and so um I just want to point people to that that paper can they get that can they where where can they find that paper at so it's under review with Semelios right okay. now um, hopefully it should be, I get some response in a few weeks and obviously the millions is free, um, when it comes out. So I guess, I guess you'd say, uh, I, I'll let you know if it's going to come out a certain time. Um, uh, yeah. So I guess that would be when it's available. Awesome. Yeah. Well, when that's available, I'll put it in the show notes and, and people can find that as well. Okay, uh, cool. Br- Brian, man, where, where can people find, uh, some more of your work if they wanted to, to get into what you're doing? Yeah. So I, I host a blog. It's a uh, read, reflect, write.org. And that's kind of where I just, you know, just it's pretty much the, the, the blog functions as a, a spillover from all my studies. Right now I am working on a, a book. It's, it's kind of weird. So like I said, I, the Lord brought me into theology late in life. Okay. So I'm 42 and I'm like, you know what? I have this desire to start on a magnum opus now. So I'm going to get going on it. Right. So I'm, I'm working on a, on a multi-volume work on really looking at the doctrine of divine simplicity and its development in the historical context. Now, it's not about, I'm not looking at certain models of simplicity, but really showing that how foundational divine simplicity has been to our doctrine of God. And then you kind of looking at how our other, other doctrines have kind of been, you know, I guess you say raised up from that concept. And so, so that the, so basically all my posts are kind of just spill over on, on, on individuals right now. I'm actually going through early church fathers and really just kind of pulling out really their, their doctrine of God, key themes from that. And I'm working on that piece. So as far as that could be eight years, five years, I have no idea. It may not go anywhere. I don't yeah. know. It's just a great time, and I've been kind of getting a lot, a lot of fruit from that. So, again, I have my blog, and then my thesis is under publication with um, Pickwick, which is from Wiffenstock. And that's uh, – right now it's November. They said it should be going through all the copy editing right now. And then I'll find out hopefully at the end of the, at the, end of the month when that will be kind of the next phase, and that will be obviously uh, available for publication soon. So that's going to be titled as, as of right now, um, A Classical Response to, to Relational Theism. Awesome, man. That sounds great. Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to grab that when it comes out. Well, dude, this has been really fun. It's been fun chopping up with you and, and talking yeah. some some like good old theology, man. It's been a while. So uh, I seriously appreciate you coming on. Thanks for, for sending me the paper early and, and giving me a first first uh, look at it. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing I want to say. So the the uh, the Journal of Classical Theology has a link, too. It's going to be J-O-C-T dot online. Okay. So you want to check that out again? Nothing's nothing's in a sense. There's no you know articles there yet. Please think I can see the site. They can sign up for the uh, get, getting notifications when the first editions come out and that kind of thing. And um, that's going to be I think a really uh, helpful work. I got a lot of people involved on that that want to be on it, and I'm really excited about you know that journal where it's going to go. Yeah, that's huge. I'm excited for that, man. Um, there's a classical and a neoclassical theologian living in my head, and they fight <laughs> often. So it'll be nice to get some more uh, fodder for the classical guy up there. For sure, man. For sure. That's awesome. All right. Well, this has been Parker's Pensies. That's going to have to do it for now, folks. Um, But follow those links, and uh, I'll be putting those in the description as well. Um, Check out Dr. Brian Ord's work, and uh, don't become a process theologian. (laughs) (laughs) This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.